Hey guys, uh, it's Chop here. Welcome to the NFTX governance call of the 7th of July. Uh, this is the second governance call which we do on a monthly routine every first Wednesday of the month uh, at the same time, so 16 uh, UTC time. Um, we don't have an agenda this time around because like, we switched the format a bit from just going through the blog post uh, to more like in-depth presentations, mainly by Goss at the moment, but we'll also switch to product teams. Uh, and I think that's enough of an intro, uh, right? Yeah, sounds good to me. Cool. All right. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to do like a little bit of a lecture today on um, like how AMMs work and how uh, our vaults work and how our vaults work with AMMs. Um, just as like a reminder to people that we're meeting basically every weekday morning, uh, like our team to go over stuff that's going on. So sometimes these meetings can feel like we're kind of putting on a show a bit because it's like a once a month thing that we do for the community. Uh, just want to let people know if you get that vibe, it's just because we're always talking on the side. Uh, and so but it's still really good for us to like, you know, get together at least once a month uh, and let people come and ask questions if they want. And I'll try and do like a short presentation each time. And if people have requests before, I'm happy to go over that. Uh, this week, I'll be going over the AMM stuff just because it seems like a uh, number of people are kind of confused about how our whole system works. Um, we we want to get more documentation out, but we also have some more like UX features we want to add in. So we think we'll probably just do that first so it's more intuitive. But um, without further ado, I will share my screen. All right, can everyone see that? Yeah, yeah, I can. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, I present. All right, this should only be like 10 minutes or so. Um, if you already understand this stuff, you know, feel free to turn on some music. Okay, so first I'll be going over SushiSwap, um, which is basically like Uniswap version two. And uh, then I'll be going over wrappers in general. I put like WBTC, but I actually ended up doing like uh, wrapped ETH. Um, and then NFTX vaults, and then we'll go over NFTX liquidity, like how that fits together with, uh, with SushiSwap. And then lastly, if we have time, we can go over options for the V1 vault deprecations or like sunsetting certain vaults like Zombie. Um, and also migrating certain vaults like base C. So, all right, sushi swap. <laughs> sushi swap is um, every sushi swap pool is its own smart contract. And basically, how it works um, well, first, I should say an AMM um, that stands for automated market maker. And normally, um, exchanges, they work, I think it's like clobs or something, basically a centralized limit order book. And that means that like people put orders up um, and AMM is different because there's always liquidity. Uh, there's no like market making orders. People just put in the assets and how it works is the contract is always kind of two sided. It keeps two different balances and it always keeps these balance. It always keeps these assets um, set as equal amounts, which you'll see in a second. So like in this example, I'm going to do uh, USDC and USDT. Normally pairs, uh, they're, they're paired with ETH, but uh, this is a bit easier. So Alice comes along. Um, she adds 100 USDC and 100 USDT. Um, and in return for adding those assets, she, she receives SLP tokens, which means Sushi Liquidity Provider. Um, there's a formula for how many... SLP tokens receive. I just put one, two, three, four, just to ignore that. And then how the price formula works is that you divide one number by the other and then you get the price. So right now with a hundred on both sides, the price is just one USDT to get one USDC. So then Bob comes along and he wants to buy one USDT and he, has, he can do that using one USDC. Uh, and then he also has to add a 0.3% fee and that fee goes to the pool. And that's basically like Alice's incentive to be providing liquidity. So after he makes this trade, what happens is the USDC balance goes up and the USDT balance goes down. 
Uh, but the contract still keeps these two numbers. Um, it keeps the prices aligned, even though the quantities have changed. So what it does is since there's less USDT than there is USDC, the contract basically says now USDT is more expensive than USDC. Um, and if you look at the price here, or if we flip it, the price of USDC, it's only 0 0.98 now. So then we go on once more. Um, and then Carol comes along and then she trades in the opposite direction. Um, and she's able to buy a full USDC for just 0 0.98 USDT plus the 0.3% fee again. Um, and then it gets closer to that 100-100. Um, and the price gets closer to 1.0. Um, and then, so so what happens is as people trade, like this is kind of a, not a great example because there's only two trades here, but as these trades go back and forth, um, it kind of accumulates a 0.3% fee so that the sushi pool, pool actually grows over time. And then what happens is Alice's one, two, three, four sushi tokens or sushi L LP tokens become worth more. Um, so in this example, she's able to return her 1,234 SLP tokens and she'll receive all the capital back. Um, it actually worked out so that it was less than $200, which just goes to show how impermanent loss is a problem and also number rounding. But in general, the trading volume should, you know, accumulate these small fees so that Alice is earning money over time. And yeah, just quick overview, AMMs always have liquidity. Um, the liquidity is proportional to the, how large the pool is. Um, moving in one direction creates an arbitrage opportunity in the opposite direction. And over time, that 0.3% fee accrues for the LPs by the pool growing. So next, wrappers. I was actually, uh, I was explaining wrappers to uh, my buddy yesterday and I, I was saying how it's interesting because up until like a year ago, I always assumed like wrappers literally p had the object inside of them. Um, and it wasn't until I started messing around with solidity that I realized that's not really how it works. Um, so I'll go over wrappers here just to kind of give an intro for our own vaults. Um, and I've made the, the accounts in green and the smart contracts in purple. So Alice's account, she has 10 ether and she has zero wrapped ether. And then the wrapped ether contract, it's it's a lot like an escrow account. Um, so it's just kind of like a vault and then it holds the ether in it. So right now, you know, it has zero, Alice has all of her ether. If Alice wants one wrapped ether, what she has to do is hand over one ether to the wrapped contract. Um, and then when she gives it her one ether, she receives one wrapped ether in return. So then the contract ends up with one ether in it um, she ends up with nine ether and then she has her one wheat. And just going over this more, like if she wanted to get that ether back, she would have to hand back her wrapped ether. So like that wrapped ether that she has, it doesn't actually have the ether inside of it. It's, it's just like an IOU token. Um, it's kind of even how like money used to work with banks. Like the, the money was backed by gold, um, but you, the gold never actually moved, right? You just moved the money around. Um, and so people, you know, when they think of wrappers, they think that the object's actually inside of it, but it's actually more like an escrow or, uh, or a proxy. Like you're escrowing all the assets in some vault and then you're getting some token which represents your share of it. So now if we go to NFTX vaults, um, NFTX vaults are actually a lot like wrappers. Um, the only difference is that the asset which is getting pooled in the vault is non-fungible, which makes it a bit more difficult. But if we look at this example again, you know, you have Alice's account and you have the Meeb contract, just for example. Alice has three Meebits and she has zero Meeb. So if she wants, oh, I messed up in the slide here. <laughs> but if she were to hand over two, two Meebits, then she would get two Meeb in return. That's a, that's a mistake. It should be two. Um, and then, so then the two me bits are in this contract, they're in this vault, right? And then she has these two tokens and that just represents the ownership. Uh, the difference here is that there's an added level of complexity because if she goes to redeem, um, if she goes to redeem them, it'll be random which one she redeems unless she does a target redeem. But the point is that I want people to understand is that vaults, they really aren't that much more complicated than a wrapper. Um, and like even... 
you know, stuff like taxes, it's like realistically, it shouldn't be that much different than just putting Ether into the wrapped Ether account and receiving your wrapped Ether back. Um, it's, you know, the analogy is very similar. So now we're going to step it up once more. Um, and we're going to add in the, uh, the sushi. So on the left here, we have the NFTX vault with the Meeb contract with Alice's account. Um, and then we have the sushi pool over here, like how we talked about before, you know, this two-sided pool, right? And for this example, I've switched it so that Alice now has 100 Meeb. And there's 100 me bits in the Meeb contract, just to simplify. And for this example, I've also assumed that every Meeb is worth one ETH which is low, uh, but all good. So the first thing Alice will do after she's, you know, Alice, let's say Alice is the first person that's creating the Mebit contract basically, or the Mebit vault. Um, she's already deployed the vault. She's put her hundred Mebits into the, the vault and she's received her hundred Meeb tokens. The next thing she's gonna do is she's gonna take her hundred Meeb tokens and she's gonna put them uh, into the sushi pool along with an equal amount of ether an equal amount in value uh, to kind of bootstrap that pool. So she um, she mints 100 Meeb and then she LPs with the 100 Meeb and also the 100 Ether. That should say 100 Ether up here, another mistake, sorry. Um, so then we have 100 Meeb uh, down here and then we have 100 Ether and then I've added in Bob now too, Bob comes along. So let's say Bob comes along and Bob wants to buy a Meebit. He wants to buy Meebit 1042 which is in the Meeb contract, um, that's a specific Meebit, so he's gonna have to pay a 5% fee. So he's gonna need to buy one Meeb plus 5%, um, and then he'll pay using Ether, and then he'll also pay a 0.3% charge for the sushi, for the sushi trade. So he hands over 1.053 Ether, and he receives 1.05 Meeb back. Um, as a result, you know, the sushi pool changes balances slightly, and then what he does is he goes over to the Meeb contract. He hands over his 1.5, 1.05 Meeb, and then he gets his 1042 Meebit NFT. And then the Meebit contract, it still has 99 uh, Meebits in it. Uh, it's just missing this one that he just bought. And then he has this Meebit and you know, everything else is, uh, is great. So if we look at what's going on here. There's, there's basically two transactions, right? First, he has to go to the sushi swap pool and he has to get his Meeb. And then second, he has to go to the Meeb contract and burn it to get his actual NFT. And so we can see these transactions happening here. There's actually two fees that he's paying as well. Um, the first fee is on sushi swap and that's where Alice is earning this 0.3% and she's gonna earn that in ether because that's the asset that Bob is paying with. And then the second fee um, is the 0.05 Meeb, which Alice will earn when Bob actually buys this specific NFT from NFTX. And if you see at the bottom of that Meeb contract, that, that Meeb basically goes into the contract to get distributed as fees later. And that's the end of the, the presentation that I had ready. But I just so like everyone realizes what's going on here, um, you know, there's, there's two pieces of the puzzle. One piece are the vaults, and then another piece is the sushi, sushi swap AMM. And by combining this, we allow people to basically buy and sell inventory on NFTX by using sushi swap. Uh, a couple points to note here. The first thing is that the fees on NFTX are much, much higher than sushi swap, um, possibly almost 15 times as high because it's 5% instead of point. 3%, um, which is pretty awesome. And that just goes to show like how the yields are so much juicier or the margins are so much juicier in the NFT space. Um, that's why we're pretty excited about rolling this out and the potential yield. And there was one other thing I was gonna mention. Um, sorry, just give me a sec. Nope. I don't remember. <laughs> um, anyway, so that's basically how that all works. Um, yeah, sorry, blank there. But the other thing I wanted to talk about here, I'll take this down, um, stop sharing. If anyone has questions, definitely feel free to ask me questions. The other thing I wanted to mention is just that um, we can also talk about like how do we want to sunset the other vaults. Um, I don't know if we should yeah. wrap this I up or what. I have a question. Yep. By the way, which I which I was thinking of today. So, 
uh, because you presented this, basically uh, Alice can also stake, right? So as an in inventory provider, she can stake on Sushi. The single-sided? Um, uh, no, double-sided. So oh oh yeah, stake or SLPs, yeah. Yeah yeah. Uh, so so this, the the SLP she gets back from Sushi, uh, like when it's rolled out for V two of NFTX, uh, she can also stake it with us to capture like protocol fees. Mm -hmm. um, how is the accrual of those protocol fees uh, working? Like, yeah, so I know, and I didn't want to add in. It's actually another contract, and I didn't want to add it in just to confuse people. But there's a fee distributor contract. Um, so with Sushi, it just goes into the pool and the pool gets bigger. But with mm -hmm. NFTX, it actually um, it gets set aside in like a fee distributor contract. And then I'm pretty sure whenever someone enters or exits the staked position, then those fees get distributed. Um, yeah. And right now they're just going to our DAO because we have rewards turned off. But in the future, yeah, they'll uh, they'll keep, they'll like go to the fee distributor and then people will, it'll be kind of like, sushi farming a year ago you'll be able to go and reap your rewards mm -hmm. they'll kind of be set aside i'm pretty they're, sure they're that's how it's going they're distributed on every transaction uh, every mint right. and redeem and target redeem yeah dope nope. and, uh, and what are like uh, i'm asking because like let's say um uh these like x tokens we call them right the token you get back the io uh, v the tokens states. now Oh yeah, I, X tokens. X Never tokens, mind, X right. tokens. Yeah. <laughs> the so the <laughs> it's basically your IOU on the SLP you're staking. Mm -hmm. um, when you use that token as collateral elsewhere, like let's say uh, Ave integrates it, or there's something like Onsen supporting X tokens instead of the like Vault tokens, mm -hmm. like, is that is that that uh, fee that gets distributed is that still going to the original SLP staker? Kiwi. Um, yeah, you mean the LP fees? Uh, yeah, that, that's still going to the actual. So then, in that case, it would be going to the contract which holds the SL the the, the extra. No, the, the, the 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 SLP fees they they make the take they technically make the pool larger. So okay. uh, no, they, no, as not long the SLP you have fees. The, oh, what? the NFTX fees that go to the staked SLPs. Oh yeah. yeah, those go. So those are those are distributed like dividends. Mm -hmm. Um, so as long as whoever, whoever is supposed to own those, like if I, if I stake and I get X SLP and then mm -hmm. I use my X SLP in Aave, I can still claim my rewards on oh, yeah. NFTX, okay. but my collateral is yeah. still locked, of course. So I can yeah. just claim. Okay. Dope. Yeah. That's cool. Um, and I remembered the other thing I was going to say, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is important, which is right now, um, just for anyone watching this, I'm sure most of the people here already know. But right now, you know, the user has to go and do these two separate things. Like first, they have to go over to Sushi Swap, and they have to buy their tokens, and then they have to come back, and then they have to spend their tokens. That's something that we're going to be um, abstracting away in the next week or so. Um, so basically, how it will work is the user can just come to the vault, they'll see everything, um, all the prices, and what it costs, and we'll just be doing the calculation of how much ether that would cost, and then you can just click buy. And the website will take care of the rest. You know, it'll fire off your ether to sushi swap. It'll use that ether to buy some vault tokens. It'll bring the vault tokens back. It'll give the vault tokens to the vault, and it'll give you your NFT. So that whole complex process um, can just kind of go into the background then. But it's still really good for people to understand. I think what's going on, uh, just so you know, you have an intuitive grasp on the system. Yeah. I'm glad I remembered that. Bugging me. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and we can, why don't we talk a bit about um, sunsetting vaults? Because uh, I know it's something Kiwi's been thinking about. Um, the first thing I'll say is just that like with the V version one vaults, uh, chances are there's going to be some vaults that stick around, um, not many. And then there's going to be some that are getting migrated over to version two. So for example, the Bored Ape uh, vault, base C vault, um, there's a new base C vault on version two. So we'll be giving users um we're, we might we might create like a migration contract or something to help them migrate it gets a little bit more complicated uh for vaults which aren't on version two so like the zombie vault for instance uh we're thinking of sunsetting it just because the liquidity is so low some people have been kind of waiting months to get out of this vault uh it seems like the best solution for something like that is for us to override the contract with the dao 
auction off the NFTs and then um, give those proceeds to the actual vault token ho- holders. Uh, do you have yeah, any yeah. thoughts on this, Kiwi? Yeah. I was thinking, so like for Bake, uh, basically we just have like a, like a migration contract that just we set like migration pairs. That's like from V1 token to V2 token, right? And then we swipe the NFTs from V1, mint them on V2, and then put them up for one-to-one redeeming uh, in that contract. Um, so then whoever wants to redeem from V1 can just swap oh, it from V2. But you, you don't want to override the V1 contract. Like we, you'd still nothing, get a full, nothing a full outside token, of, right? Yeah, nothing outside of taking the NFTs out. Because I don't know, I don't want to mess with too much of the logic on there. Like just a rescue function yeah. doesn't change the storage, doesn't change anything else, you know. We just maybe like remove like the, the mint function to make more room oh, okay. in the code or something. So we, and then, we would upgrade it. Yeah, yeah. And then, unless it, it doesn't have a rescue function already, right? And then what we'd call the, re- like you'd only call the rescue function once and it would execute this for everything? Uh, um... I mean, we could um, probably best to do it in parts per NFT, I guess, because it's not going to be for everything at once. And then for for stuff like zombie, um, we could probably just use a similar contract for the migration, but set up a migration ratio. And that way it's like, oh, one zombie is equal to like five or like 550 ETH or whatever. What if there's like, what if there's like one account that has like 0.01 zombie in it and that person's like gotten hit by a bus or something? Yeah, I mean, that's, then then we'll just then they just Override. redeem and we'll we'll just yeah, I mean we'll, we'll just if we leave it open for like a month, mm-hmm. if no one if no one migrates or whatever, we just see how many people have migrated by then. Yeah, um, eventually just, I think we are we might have to override eventually. Yeah, um, if if there's a which it, it's I like I should mention like that's something I've said from the start that that's like how we would you know unwind vaults if necessary we would just do it with the DAO. Um, I know it's not ideal, but for something like Zombie that's worth like 400 Ether, it's it's kind of shitty to leave one stuck in there. Yeah. Yeah, once yeah, we, we got, got one it. buyout done, we'll be able to do all of them, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, I think the, the most important thing for anyone listening to this is that um, since we do plan on doing something about it, those tokens have value. Like, you might not see they're, that they're value for backed, a month yeah. or two. Yeah, they're still they're back. Still back. And like we plan on like distributing that value somehow, like, and we have the power as a DAO. Um, so yeah, if they, if they get, if the prices go too low, then you know it's, there's alpha there. Cool. Yeah. Um, that's all like I need to talk about. Um, uh, if anyone has questions, I guess Scotchpreneurs or or Will's here too. Cool. Um, yeah, if anyone has questions, feel free to ask questions. If not, you know, like I said. Uh, we're meeting every morning, so um, yeah, we're usually hashing out stuff on our own, uh, but it's still nice to do this once a month. Shout outs to Scott for making the punk pool that let us. Yeah, dude. You. I'm glad you didn't get hacked, bro. <laughs> I was like, oh, surely the coast is clear. Scott's already set it up. <laughs> and if that pool wasn't there, it probably would have been worse. <laughs> Yeah, I can't tell if that helped or hurt the situation. Nah, that so. definitely helps because if we oh. if we put if we probably seeded it with two and then on our next migration moved like three or four or five, like it would have gone that. Like because the pool is there, they were able to detect that that plus that positive EV. Yeah, it was like a it was like a honey pot because he got sucked in for only selling it for ten ether, which wasn't very smart. Yeah. He should have redeemed. Okay. Um but yeah, no, I'm glad that didn't go worse than it did. And it seems like everything's going smoothly now, which yeah. is pretty awesome. Oh, I should mention um, to anyone who didn't see my post, I totally forgot to vote on the Aragon stuff. So I staged that like over 24 hours ago. Um, so we were hoping to have more inventory moved over by this morning. I'm going to do that right after this call. And then it takes 24 hours. So then we'll we'll move over like another 15, 20% uh, for punks, glyphs, avastars, and kitty. Um, since those are like treasury vaults sort of and then um, and then yeah hopefully we have like the stakings app ready soon and we can turn on rewards within the next week or so yeah guys i wanted to visit um since the big blocker for a rabbit hole campaign was uh the subgraph and Mm -hmm. got the subgraph for v2 and sounds like rewards are pretty close we could probably tee up a proposal for 
a rabbit hole campaign if that's interesting. Oh, 100 percent. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'd love that. So, um, what are we talking about? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what this is. Rabbit hole. It's like a. It's like an app for like you. It's kind of like paid. Um, people earn rewards by like trying out a product. Is that correct, Scott? Yeah, exactly. So they would maybe uh, get a hold of some punk or uh, mint uh, something in another vault and then get a different level of reward, potentially. Yeah, it's a cool project. Um, it's a great way for yeah. people to like incentivize like learning. And uh, no, I'd like to support that for sure. Yeah. Great. I think Rabbit Hole is definitely great. Like incentivizing actions for new users is what you do like with farming. So it's it's another mm -hmm. way to, to do it. So yeah, I think it's a it's a great thing to do. Yeah, agreed. Um, I I think like Nick is probably the the most like uh, competent person in regards to the subgraph right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll Nick, talk Nick to him. The He's at his wedding anniversary. Oh, nice. Yeah, no. <laughs> Sounds good. I'll follow up with you guys. We'll uh, yeah. get proposable together. Sorry, what's that, Scott? No, well. Yeah, I'll, I'll follow up with you guys and oh, get it okay. uh, put together for sure. Perfect. Thanks, man. Yeah. Cool. Um, all right, Chop, I'll let you finish this off. Yeah. Else. Um, yeah. Like on, on governance, uh, I, I probably this is probably a good place to uh, to discuss that uh, because we had a grant request. You remember from uh, Peer, I think. Yes. Uh, yeah, Peer. Yeah, so I made a comment there, uh, basically because a couple community members, also team members, had questions but uh, wasn't followed up upon. So I'm feeling like it makes sense to just close it down uh, at the end of this month if it's like like it's holiday season, kind of. So there's like some delay maybe. Uh, but if the, if it's really going AFK, I'll just close down the foreign post unless anyone feels different yeah i think that's yeah there's no rush but this this show yeah yeah cool and oh yeah then the, another thing i want to I'm, I'm thinking of bringing up on governance level is the audit so like on the on the dailies we've been talking about uh getting v2 audited after steps are done and all that kind of stuff like a proper audit no uh, code reviews um but that takes time and probably also a lot of funds. So it's probably good to initiate a governance process around it, but I'm not really sure at which stage because the, like, should we, we should find someone first. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of the question. Like, do we find, yeah, no, we should find someone and then we should just, um, kind of like, um, just propose get, this yeah, push, push it through governance in like a yeah, few yeah. days. Uh, okay. just make sure that there's no one vetoing it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Go. Cool. Uh, cool, man. I think that's it then, yeah? Yeah. Great. There'll cool. be a test next week. No, I'm kidding. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> We're, yeah. We don't have a meeting until next month anyways. No. Oh, yeah. That's a good one. I'm, I'm not at the meeting next month because I'm on a, on a beach. Okay. Hopefully Just make I, sure you remind me. That my five doesn't nice. crash. Yeah. Okay. My personal right. assistant. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Well, uh, I think we'll close off the governance call then. Uh, just just to remind, like the, the governance schedule is every first Wednesday. So the next one is August 4th, uh, same time. So 16 UTC again. Uh, and that's it. Thanks for coming, everybody. Uh, and I'll upload the video on YouTube. Cool. See you guys. Adios. See you.